Değerli katılımcılar, sevgili arkadaşlar, bizi tüm sosyal medya platformları üzerinden izleyen bilim dostu, bilgisayar, güzel insanlar. Herkese iyi akşamlar. TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitüsü, bilimin ufukları kapsamında sürdürdüğü araştırma ve eğitim faaliyetlerinin ayrılmaz bir parçası olarak, uluslararası düzeyde ilham verici seminerler serisi düzenlemektedir. Temel bilimin çeşitli alanları ile disiplinler arası alanları kapsayan ve ülkemizin ve dünyanın dört bir yanında ilgi odağına çevrilen bu etkinlikler, en üst düzey ve yenilikçi bilgilerin tartışıldığı ortamlardır. Bu etkinlikler aynı zamanda bilimde ilerlemenin klasik yolunu en iyi olanları dinlemek, onlardan öğrenmek, daha sonra kendi yolunda ilerlemek gayesini aydınlatmaktadır. Bu akşam yine bu düşüncelerle ve enstitutumuzun kimya bilimleri seminer serisi kapsamında bir güzel bölüm daha gerçekleştirmek üzere bir araya gelmiş bulunmaktayız. Ben de her zaman olduğu kimi yine bu vesileyle hepinizi saygı ve sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Günümüzde temel bilimin en önemli başarılarından biri, insanoğlunun atomistik düzeni manipüle etme kabiliyetine kavuşmuş olmasıdır. Bu durumun bir sonucu olarak, örneğin, atomlar arası mesafelerin ve kafes geometrisinin sabit olduğu atomik ve moleküler kristalların aksine, tasarımcı atomlardan oluşan nanokristal diziler, sürekli olarak ayarlanabilen özelliklere sahip nesnelerdir. Nanokristaller ve nanokristal düzenekler, istenen elektronik, optik, manyetik ve katalitik özelliklere sahip, iki ve üç boyutlu malzemelerin tasarlanması için çok yönlü bir platform sunmaktadır. Bu durum endüstriyel ve teknolojik alanlarda yeni asılımlar yaratacak, yeni yarı iletken kuantum noktaların ve diğer yeni modüler malzemelerin geniş uygulamalarına yol açmaktadır. Bu akşam bu konuları kimya bilimleri perspektifinden ve konunun dünyaca ünlü uzmanı ABD'deki Chicago Üniversitesi'nden Profesör Dimitri Talapin'den dinleyeceğiz. Son derece değerli bir bilim insanı olan Dimitri Talapin, malzeme tasarımına modüler bir yaklaşım konulu bir konuşma yapacaktır. Seminerimiz İngilizce olarak gerçekleştirilecektir. Dear participants, dear colleagues and friends, hello everyone and good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you for this episode of the Chemical Sciences Seminar Series of TÜBİTAK Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences with the participation of Professor Dimitri Talapin from the University of Chicago in the United States. Professor Dimitri Talapin is a distinguished scientist and world-class expert in the field. He is going to give a great talk entitled The Modular Approach to Materials Design. At the end of the talk, we will have Q&A session. Please ask questions by sending a message through the chat button of the Zoom platform or just by raising hand. Dimitri Talapin is the Ernest David Burton Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Chemistry, the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. Dimitri Talapin's group has broad expertise in synthesis, self-assembly, surface chemistry, and device applications of inorganic nanomaterials. His research interests lie in the development of novel functional materials through the as assembly of rationally de designed nanoscale and molecular components. Dimitri was born in Soviet Union and grew up in Belarus, received a doctorate degree from the University of Hamburg, Germany in 2002 followed by postdoctoral work at the IBM Watson Research Center. From 2005 to 2007, 
there was a staff scientist at the molecular foundry at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and finally joined the faculty to the University of Chicago in 2007. Professor Dimitri Talapin has received a number of honors and awards, including IBM Invention Achievement Award, NSF Career Award, Material Research Society Outstanding Young Investigator Award, American Chemi Chemical Society Akron Award, Inorganic Nanoscience Award, and, and many others. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, fellow of the Institute of Molecular Engineering. With this, I want to invite Professor Dimitri Talapin to the stage to begin his talk. Dimitri, good morning. Good morning. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work. And let me share screen and uh, tell you about um, the research that uh, we've been doing recently. And um, the work that I will be talking about uh, has been done mostly at the University of Chicago, which is a beautiful university, one of the world top research universities in, uh, in physical sciences and many other aspects of human knowledge. And um, our outline for today will be largely um, focused on three topics. First, I plan to talk about um, or discuss uh, the different chemical approaches that uh, my group has been exploring to uh, achieve atomic or bring come one step closer towards the atomic precision for materials design at the nanoscale, for nanoscale engineering. And second topic will be more also broad discussion of what we can and what we cannot synthesize um, uh, in solution. And the third topic is, uh, <laughs> I will keep you puzzled for a moment. Now, um, let me, uh, to set the stage for our discussion, let me uh, talk about one, uh, well, draw a, an analogy that I, I noticed some time ago and I found a very interesting and important um, is uh, that uh, materials that I will be talking about, uh, or more specifically inorganic nanomaterials are close causing to <clears throat> organic macromolecules. And in many ways, in terms of applications, in terms of fundamental principles uh, governing their um, synthesis and evolution, we can learn from the work that has been done previously in pol design of polymers. And probably one of the important and uh, fundamental questions in this uh, design of macromolecular systems was to what degree can we control synthesis of the polymers? And uh, it was a big intellectual leap for chemistry community to move from or accept that uh, we can have something materials with no atomic precision, but uh, still very useful and uh, understandable. And, but then um, in the later uh, decades, a uh, few decades, people, organic chemists started playing uh, with ideas, how can they bring atomic precision even to such giant molecules like polymers. These nanocrystals that are made build of hundreds of atoms, um, we can, uh, now a design, uh, well, we, we come into same questions. So, and let me show you a video of a typical synthesis of colloidal uh, nanoparticles. And uh, we have two solutions, one in the syringe, one in the flask, mix them together, they <laughs> uh, change color. And in few minutes we have uh, nanomaterials and a lot of in important and complex phenomena are taking place during these few minutes, uh, or few, sometimes few seconds. First, our mo molecular precursors, our molecules react and go through the very complex nucleation process. And then after we nucleate a new phase and this new phase can be 
a metal, a semiconductor, a magnetic material, this phase evolves um, by growing into um, or adding units, molecular units to the growing crystal and just keep increasing in size. And um, at some point when we have very small molecules, we can, uh, uh, control, we can isolate small crystals, we call them clusters, with true atomic precision. But when we move past certain size, typically hundreds of atoms, we lose ability to control this material matter with atomic precision. So just adding a unit, uh, a structural unit, removing structural unit does not change um, um, free energy or chemical potential. And we cannot use thermodynamics to, to do it. Pretty much same problem as with polymers. So we started uh, thinking about how this approach can be uh, uh, dealt with, or if we can bring atomic precision to the synthesis of huge, uh, um, like thousands, tens of thousands of atoms, uh, materials um, and uh, nanomaterials. And uh, first uh, we should look at the nucleation event. So nucleation is, is a very difficult uh, and not fully understood process, but uh, phenomenologically, it, it can be described quite well within the framework of classical nucleation theory, where if you have a homogeneous nucleation of a new phase, it's a competition of two energy scales. It's a competition of um, energy, uh, surface energy that you need to pay to generate a new phase and separate, separate it uh, with surface uh, from the rest of the system. And, but at the same time, your gain, energy gain is that you generate a more thermodynamically stable phase. And this competition of surface uh, scaling versus volume scaling give you a very characteristic effect of nucleation barrier and critical nucleus. And in the recent years, there were several interesting developments along this line where it has been first uh, noticed by the team uh, led by David Norris at uh, ETH Zurich, where um, if in the pre-critical uh, regime, the system can undergo interesting fluctuation, uh, can undergo fluctuations that kind of force the pre-critical nucleus to, into anisotropic shape. And then the system can choose two different nucleation uh, pathways. One is uh, to grow a uh, more spherical crystal by uh, growing like two dimensional layers one by one or by growing like stripes, um, narrow stripes, which are more like a one dimensional nucleation. And we generalized this uh, approach and uh, constructed uh, potential energy surfaces describing this effect of nucleation uh, in the of, of formation of anisotropic nuclei. And we have shown that this effect that in addition to classical nucleation barrier that described by classical nucleation series, there are also this uh, potential energy surface has pathways or valleys that lead to metastable pro uh, products that, um, and these products can be atomically precise like wires or play or two dimensional platelets, or if you have energy, enough energy to climb fully uh, full activation barrier, you can grow to three dimensional crystals. And uh, it can be demonstrated by solution synthesis or fine tuned solution synthesis of different systems. For example, you can start with uh, zinc uh, precursor and selenium precursor and react them and depending on temperature, you can, the system can navigate different pathways on this free energy uh, surface along this free energy surface and same material with cubic unit cell will form one dimensional atomically precise wires or two dimensional platelets with atomically precise thickness or something uh, or like more like three dimensional structures. And that has been uh, best, uh, I think, optimized to date uh, for growing, uh, for finding these valleys leading to two dimensional uh, structures that uh, have electronic structure of quantum wells. So they're colloidal quantum wells, but they have true atomic precision along the thickness. So we can make, and it's a chemistry, so it's solution synthesis. So you can make grams, kilograms, you can scale it. So it's these can easily go into commodity uh, materials. 
And since, uh, and we can here control dimension or size of the structure with true atomic precision only along one dimension, the smallest dimension, the thickness. But in the system, in the strong quantum confinement regime, it is the uh, dimension that fully controls the electronic structure of the system. And as a result, we can make a very uh, materials with very sharp ensemble uh, emission lines and um, very, very interesting material systems. But if we want to turn it into a complete methodology for growing like really truly complex structures or just trying to mimic uh, material complexity of the material systems that uh, people can grow by molecular beam epitaxy, for example, uh, we need to couple this atomically controlled nucleation to ability to grow systems with atomic precision following the nucleation event. And that has been accomplished by taking an inspiration from the process used in pretty much every CMOS uh, semiconductor foundry um, and almost every clean room known as atomic layer deposition. So you, uh, well, in uh, semiconductor technology, we routinely use uh, so a process called uh, atomic layer deposition, where you can grow conformal layers of, for example, oxides, and that is used in uh, transistors to, to grow so-called gate dielectric layers. And the way how you can grow this from gas phase in a very, in a very conformal way is to split the reaction into two complementary half reactions, where each reaction is self-limiting. So you you grow one monolayer, then you grow another monolayer, then you grow yet another monolayer. And we developed an analog of this uh, process for that can be done in solution, not in uh, gas phase. And that allows you to grow um, heterostructures, semiconductor heterostructures with uh, starting with our atomically precise uh, uh, su substrates and, uh, and then add one layer at a time, atomic layer at a time and grow nearly arbitrary sequences of atomic layers in solution. And for example, synthesize like uh, epitaxial stacks of multiple quantum wells separated by um, barriers that are also engineered with close to atomic precision. So or more accurately, atomic layer precision. And this is an example of cross-sectional transmission electron microscope image of a triple quantum well heterostructure synthesized in solution. And it's we have many, many of them synthesized simultaneously. So and then again, if we need kilogram of these structures, they can be made. And why and that was probably one of the first, if not the first example of structure of kind of materials that have, have complex materials grown with close to atomic control. And uh, it kind of brings us one uh, step closer to ultimate goal of that we can formulate as like making building digital nanomaterials where we control systems down to atomic layer. And we can now um, map uh, physical principles like band gap engineering, interface engineering, strain engineering onto experimental observables like line widths, quantum yields or J rates and engineer materials with superior properties. So it's uh, just as the first steps down um, along these lines is um, we uh, demonstrated some time ago the ability to that we found that these materials uh, can act as an excellent optical amplification, optical gain medium and for lasing. So we all know that quantum wells are <laughs> really good materials for lasing. Now we can make them in solution, we can process them. And I want uh, to emphasize the role in the development of uh, this field uh, uh, done, uh, well, accomplished by the group of Volkan Demir at Bilkent University. He is, uh, in my opinion, undoubtedly a world leader in uh, Nonlinear uh, optics and lasing using colloidal quantum wells, the structures that are um, shown here. So we we did some of the, uh, of the early work, and now his group is doing amazing, amazing uh, research um, into by transforming um, colloidal uh, nano nanoplatelets or colloidal quantum wells into really lasers that can enter the 
commercial market. Now, um, <clears throat> we are now going after even more complex phenomena such as study, uh, if you have a multiple stacks of multiple quantum wells, you can uh, generate new quantum states of matter, you can um, couple uh, excitations in different uh, quantum wells to same optical field and we see some early, well, some spectroscopic signatures of superfluorescent response where the individual quantum wells in, in our epitaxial stacks synthesized in solution can couple together and act as a single quantum system, um, preserving phase coherence um, between, well, involving multiple uh, chromophores, multiple quantum wells. So, and it's just a kind of first steps of the exploration because whenever you have a platform for material design, you can make, uh, it typically leads to interesting developments. And, um, but now let me switch gears. And um, I'm afraid that I painted too optimistic picture. So it looked like we can synthesize materials with nanomaterials with true atomic precision. So maybe it's the game over and we can, uh, uh, we solved all the problems. And not really. So everything that I told you about, well, showed before, worked for one particular class of semiconductors, so-called 2,6 semiconductors, so calcogenide semiconductors. And there are many other materials that uh, are equally or even more important, uh, such as gallium arsenide, um, gallium nitride, and, um, there is a, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to make these materials by solution chemistry. The problem is that you, you probably, uh, you remember that video that I was showing you, the video of synthesis. And I, that time I didn't show you, uh, gave you full detail. And this flask was preheated to 370 degrees Celsius. He had the solution preheated to 370 degrees Celsius. And this is probably the highest temperature, very close to the highest temperature that we can approach, achieve before solvent starts falling apart. It's the highest temperature for organic, so close to highest temperature achievable for organic solvents reliably. And um, if we now uh, compare it to the temperatures that we use for chemical vapor deposition synthesis, for example, of gallium arsenide or gallium nitride, it's, it will be very far away from um, what we need to achieve in order to uh, get perfect structural uh, perfection of the, uh, to achieve structural perfection to heal uh, or anneal defects and, and grow uh, high quality, like this extremely important 3.5 semiconductor. So it's, it gives, it shows you, highlights the limitation of solution chemistry as a field. So we uh, cannot operate at the temperatures that have been previously identified as optimal for synthesis of some of the worst world most important electronic and optoelectronic materials. And that led us to think about possible uh, solutions to this problem. And if we can move, uh, if we can make um, uh, phases by so solution chemistry that require high temperatures. And that probably the most thermally stable solvents I can think of it would be molten inorganic salts. And we moved in and we started playing with molten inorganic salts as solvents for, for doing colloidal chemistry um, several years ago. And to our surprise, it was the very first examples to the best of our knowledge uh, of colloidal demonstration of colloidal stability in molten salts. And these are probably arguably some of the <laughs> first examples of molten salt of colloidal, colloidal dispersions in molten inorganic salts. And uh, in fact, just uh, as a side comment, you probably think that it, when we think about molten salt, you probably think about something like liquid molten sodium chloride, and that melts at around 900 Celsius. And um, it's not uh, request, required to be that high temperature. So for example, there are uh, molten salt eutectics that melt at temperatures like 100 degrees Celsius. So you can even do pretty, quite high precision chemistry using this um, um, molten salts. 
And uh, I was asking myself around that time, how comes that this colloidal stability in molten salts has not been discovered like 100 years ago? Because molten salts have been around, small particles have been around, smart people have been around. And the only rational explanation of why uh, it has not been done before to me was that still the, even the fact of stability of uh, colloidal stability in molten salt goes against all our current knowledge of uh, what you need to have a colloidal, to form a stable colloidal solution. The idea here is that if you want uh, to make a colloidal solution dispersion, you need to have pair interactions, uh, or pair potentials, uh, net repulsive. So your particles or whatever else you have in solution, when the two, when the two particles come close together, they should feel repulsive potentials. They should not aggregate. And there will be always attractive component to the potential one der Waals attraction. And you need to have a repulsive term that is stronger at, uh, than one der Waals attraction. And that in molten salt, since it's a very polarizable medium, for example, the Debye screening lens, if we define it um, classically, it will be on the order of one angstrom. It's extremely concentrated electrolyte. And that's why electrostatic repulsion, double layer repulsion will always be inferior to one der Waals attraction. So these colloids should not exist. They should, should aggregate and fall down at the bottom. And, um, um, but they do exist. <laughs> and uh, the, in the recent years, we try to understand what is going on. And uh, we are doing a lot of, uh, uh, computational work uh, and um, hard X-ray analysis um, uh, and um, modeling. So, and our the picture that is emerging that in the molten salts we have a new qualitatively new type of uh, colloidal stability or type of pair potentials and interactions between uh, particles between nanocrystals. So in the dilute electrolytes, we are dealing, we are in so-called the bihucular regime where uh, potential uh, um, drops exponentially into the solution. But if you move towards molten salt, extremely dense concentrated electrolytes, you switch to a different regime, which is based on a low range ion, ion correlations and potential is now not exponentially dropping into uh, the polarizable medium to electrolyte, but uh, starts oscillating. And you have a uh, transient layering of I cations and anions next to the surface and that we can see in the frustrated Ising model analysis, or we can see in uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And what is most important, we can see also this effect in um, hard X-ray pair distribution function analysis studies. And uh, so it maybe this, uh, it looks like this surface templated restructuring of molten salts is a new emerges as a new type of colloidal crystallization. And that's work uh, in progress. Of course, there is a lot of puzzling pieces here, but let me maybe jump to practical aspects of it. What can it do uh, for a synthetic chemist? And, there are many systems, as I already mentioned, that cannot be synthesized by solution chemistry, could not be synthesized by solution chemists, uh, despite numerous attempts over the past 30 years. And examples of these materials would be some gallium arsenide, gallium uh, and, uh, and ternary systems like indium gallium arsenide, indium gallium phosphide. And those are important materials, like world best lasers made out, out of gallium arsenide or indium gallium uh, Arsenide in gas is the best material for uh, near infrared applications and so on. And uh, in molten salts, uh, sorry, in traditional solvents, this chemistry doesn't work. Temperature needs to be too high, also chemical compatibility issues. In molten salts, we can uh, turn all these problems uh, off and make first examples of materials, uh, high quality materials. Uh, with composition in indium gallium arsenide, indium gallium phosphide, um, and gallium arsenide uh, compositions. And why we are excited about it? Because, for example, um, now the quantum dots are materials, commercialized materials uh, used in uh, displays, like Samsung is uh, selling a huge number of QLED TVs uh, each every year. And these materials are used use, uh, using indium phosphide quantum dots as uh, color converters. 
And um, indium gallium phosphide is a more thermodynamically stable phase. It's a better phase. So we are now team working together with Samsung to evaluate if these materials, new materials that have been sensitized uh, in molten salts can be a better option um, for, for TV market. And it's in general, I want to emphasize that 3.5 materials, in my opinion, of course, uh, is a way to go because these materials are, uh, well, superseded and uh, uh, all other semiconductors in every market, opti -electronic, electronic and opti electronic market, if we talk about uh, um, uh, performance. Like if you think about, this is a famous uh, chart of uh, records, uh, solar cell efficiency for different materials. And this is a semi-legitimate way to compare all kinds of semiconductors. Um, like 2635 perovskites and uh, unconventional organic semiconductors because solar cell is a demanding device. It's a minority carrier device that requires a lot of, uh, well, ultimately pushes semiconducting material to the limit in terms of it, it, its capabilities. And the upper half of this chart is exclusively three, four, the world of 35 semiconductors. And uh, I'm very excited to see the first glimpse of success uh, with, uh, using molten salt for synthesis of previously unaccessible, inaccessible 3.5 semiconductor, especially in form of quantum dots, because solution synthesis is very scalable and it can bring cost, drive cost of these materials down. And eventually we may be able to engineer very complex and unusual material systems using solution chemistry. The other place uh, area where um, Molten salt seems to made well made a big progress in the recently was uh, engineering of new, relatively young class of two dimensional transition metal carbides and nitrides known as enzymes, and these are two dimensional materials that can be made out of many different uh, early transition metals such as tit titanium, chromium, molybdenum, um, uh, vanadium. And uh, these materials are used in, uh, well, uh, already set a number of records uh, in, for energy storage applications, such as supercapacitors, batteries, materials for electromagnetic shielding and, and cat composites, catalysts. And what is what makes them special? I'm sure all of you are very aware about two-dimensional materials, the world of two-dimensional materials, a very hot topic. And when we talk about, when we think about 2D materials, we typically imply uh, graphene or molybdenum disul disulfide and other materials that uh, do not have any uh, surface, uh, okay, any possibility for surface engineering. And in zine in this respect is unique because you, it's a 2D material with surface chemistry. So each surface atom has, uh, chemical access to, uh, can be accessed chemically and form equivalent chemical bond that can be used to attach different groups uh, and control chemical reactivity, stability pr properties like energy storage properties. And uh, for many years, it has been realized, it has been recognized that yeah, it should be possible to engineer surfaces of enzymes, but the chemistry is that uh, we had in hand um, for these materials did not allow us to, to do it. So like we typically the surfaces of enzymes uh, have been a rather random mixture of hydroxa, oxo and fluoro terminations uh, that come out of like synthetic uh, process. And more uh, last year we implemented the molten salt uh, chemistry that again, allowed us to push, to do reaction in solution on one hand, but on the other hand, push it to the temperature in domain where that you wouldn't be able to accomplish with uh, traditional solvents. And um, now we can do surface engineering reactions and we can, we made about in that paper, we reported about 20 new enzyme structures showing that these materials can be superconductors, can we can control their mechanical properties, elastic properties and so on. So it's again, just another highlight showing that uh, chemistry, solution chemistry in molten salts uh, is an interesting avenue that may enable all kinds of new material systems and new applications. Now let me switch gears and uh, briefly talk about, well, to 
well, move to beyond the engineering of individual nanostructures. So I've been talking about nanoparticles, now enzymes for, uh, and these are, we can call the, we can consider them as a functional bricks of nature, that they are the smallest units that carry function, like a metal or semiconductor. If you have like one gallium atom and uh, bonded to one single selenium or arsenic atom, it will not be gallium arsenic. You need to have quantum mechanical coupling over uh, about 100 atoms or so to, for, to develop like the key aspects of the band structure or electronic structure of a semiconductor, gallium arsenide, for example. Same applies to metal, same applies to magnets, same applies to other material systems. And um, we, in, in many ways, nano, nanomaterials are these functional bricks of nature. Bricks, the smallest brick of a semiconductor, the smallest brick of metal or catalyst or a magnet and so on. Now um, we can, um, sorry. Now we can, uh, next question is how can we build with these bricks? So whenever, uh, well, we think of, of building blocks, how can we use these materials as a building blocks to, to build something bigger or complex? And here we rely on, uh, we can again draw this analogy of nanomaterials, nanocrystals as macromolecules. So if we have macromolecules and if we can uh, disperse them in a solvent, for example, we can then crystallize out of the solvent Macroscopic assemblies of these uh, structures, and uh, we can grow super lattices of uh, individual um, nanoparticles, for example, nanocrystals. So we can first put atoms in form of like hundred, uh, well, maybe sometimes thousand atoms large bricks, and then we can put all these, many of these bricks together, and we can grow crystals of nanocrystals, and or we can combine two or three components and they will grow even more complex structures. Something like, sometimes it can be truly amazing in terms of complexity uh, where we can uh, pack different uh, functional building blocks into structures, extremely complex structures. And it's this units, uh, this packing of nanoparticles that form spontaneously is isostructural with intermetallic compounds. It's a type of the unit, so like sodium chloride type structure, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, like calcium copper five, but instead of calcium, we have a 10,000 atom unit of a semiconductor. And instead of copper, we have like uh, 8,000 atom large unit of uh, ferromagnet or catalytic material, plasmonic material. And we can grow different structures, they can pack together and they can form amazingly complex uh, assemblies, amazingly complex structures, not only crystalline sometimes. Sometimes, you, well, this was the first example, like this structure is the first example of quasi-crystal. So this is uh, quasi-crystals as a material, the uh, structures that have low range order, but, they, uh, they don't have translational symmetry. And in this case, you can have, uh, uh, for example, symmetry forbidden um, elements, like for example, uh, rotational uh, symmetry axis of uh, order of five, 10, eight, this structure has a rotational order of 12th order, it's C12. Or, and uh, it's, it's one of the most amazing structures and it can be mapped onto um, square triangular, tiling and it's in, so it's material that doesn't have a uh, uh, periodicity, but it, uh, if you take a, a, a X-ray pad uh, diffraction of it, it show it acts like a perfect crystal with symmetry elements that crystal cannot have. Well, anyway, it's, it's a very interesting story on its own, but um, I want to now move towards some, a little, some more practical uh, comments and, uh, and ideas. So, Again, I showed you a very optimistic picture. <laughs> we can make different, very complex building blocks. We can make, we can pack these building blocks into amazingly complex structures. And uh, how can we turn them into functional materials? And here there is yet another caveat. And I want to emphasize, like when we start, where 
making this, uh, rebuilding these structures for the first time, uh, we um, uh, hoped that within a couple of years, we will be able to largely like rewrite solid state uh, physics textbooks by building materials like from building blocks, coupling, developing new band diagrams and so on. And, and uh, well, we used like an inspiration, this idea that if you have like sodium and chlorine and put them together, you form sodium chloride, it looks very different from sodium and chlorine. And uh, you develop a whole new electronic states. And it's not happening here uh, in this type of structures. And the reason is because in addition to uh, making amazing building blocks and uh, packing them into very interesting and complex structures, you need one more component, which is connection of ele coupling, electronic coupling between the components. So the wave functions in individual uh, structural units should uh, talk to each other and form a very strong um, exchange coupling. And you can describe it within different theoretical frameworks. For example, you can use tight binding model and look at the magnitude of the resonance integrals beta. And the problem now, we, it's not about particles. It's not about their packing. It's all about what is at their surfaces. Because if you have at the surface a layer of electrically insulating ligands, they will form a bilayer that will introduce insulating barriers between individual particles. And electronic states will not be able to delocalize. So they will be um, strongly localized on individual, uh, individual building blocks. And our <laughs> imaginary sodium chloride uh, will be a linear combination of sodium and chlorine. So just there will be no new states developing. And that's, that's a big challenge. And we spent about uh, 10 years working along these lines to solve it. But, um, and we had to completely rethink the idea of how we engineer surfaces and surface ligands and surface interactions. And uh, we, uh, that led to the development of the concept of inorganic surface ligands for nanomaterials. So we developed, uh, we and others, of course, now many people join this, uh, this field and did amazing work along these lines. But the idea here is how to design something that will have will be able to provide colloidal stability. So we can make materials and handle them in solution. But after you form a film, you, you form a active components of electronic and optoelectronic devices, how can you um, make uh, neighboring nanocrystals, so individual nanocrystals uh, talking to each other? And that you, you can do it through engineering, different types of engineering of surfaces and using inorganic chemistry, inorganic methods. And that led to very significant improvements of uh, coupling, like for example, conductivity of gold nanoparticles with organic ligand. If you compare it with gold conductivity of same particles with inorganic ligands, the difference will be about on the order of 12 orders of magnitude. So it's a huge effect. So it's a huge improvement of coupling and materials started entering uh, into so-called strong coupling region. And um, that uh, leads me to more like practical aspects of uh, what uh, these types of materials can be good for. And there is a big excitement and interest to turn these materials into a um, class, universal class of optoelectronic materials for um, uh, where we can start with um, inks, nanocrystal inks, and uh, rely on solution deposition or printing or other methods uh, and um, involving mild processing and make active components of electronic and optoelectronic devices. It's important to be realistic here. So I don't want to make any misleading claims that such materials can outperform silicon, but silicon is at its best. Probably not. But we can do things that silicon cannot do. And we can do it in a way that will complement the weaknesses of, or, or address the weaknesses of existing materials platforms. Like for example, uh, if we want to couple these materials with flexible uh, substrates, if we want to couple them to, uh, optoelectronic readout circuit. For example, silicon will never be will never be able will never be used as a material for infrared uh, applications because it's just transparent in the infrared. 
But we can make us uh, we can use CMOS circuitry to uh, build readout circuit uh, readout um, um, uh, circuit and cover it with a layer of quantum dots that are specially designed to uh, interact with infrared light, generate electron hole pairs, and be and turn silicon uh, into uh, infrared detector, for example. And you also cannot make laser out of silicon because it's indirectly a semiconductor, but uh, we can complement it with um, uh, quantum dots that are direct gap, uh, really good. And this idea of cross-platform integration is a, is a very powerful concept that can be implemented with quantum dots. And overall, I, there is a lot of work um, these days, uh, both within academia and in industry, uh, exploring practical applications of uh, nanomaterials. And here I'm talking about one small subset of nanomaterials, quantum dots, semiconductor quantum dots for uh, real world applications. And one big area uh, led by companies like Samsung, uh, TCL and uh, Philips uh, using quantum dots in light emitting uh, diodes. And the, these materials are viewed as a big uh, um, competitor and legitimate competitor to OLED technology, organic LEDs. And if you look a little deeper, it's actually OLEDs and QLEDs are not, not different technologies. It, they use same device stack and it's just different chromophores. So eventually within this industrial community, there is a belief that eventually these two fields can merge and we may use quantum dots for one type of pixels, organic uh, chromophores for the other types of pixels. The other area where these materials can be very uh, interesting is infrared and near infrared detectors where you can uh, make your inexpensive uh, CCD camera sensitive or CMOS camera chip sensitive to infrared. And there is a lot of interest from um, smartphone manufacturers for this. There is a lot of interest in this energy technology domain, uh, solar concentrators, solar cells, and even agriculture. It turned out that these materials are very potentially interesting for agricultural applications. And the idea is the following. So you, well, <laughs> leaves are uh, are uh, green because they have a uh, chlorophyll has an absorption band in the orange red part of spectrum and they have an absorption deep in the green and uh, if you in the greenhouse install uh, these layers where quantum dots and here you need to look for non-toxic quantum dots of course and inexpensive in polymer matrix and they can be designed, these quantum, these layers can, films can be designed that they absorb full sp sun spectrum and convert it into red orange light that is uh, spectrally tuned to the absorption band of chlorophyll. And that based on the current uh, experiments, uh, studies, uh, it significantly increases the crop yield. And so you see, it's, it's a huge, parameter space to innovate uh, from the practical points of view. And um, my lab uh, spent some quite a lot of time working on different all-in organic nanocrystal devices, implementing ideas that we developed for surface engineering to achieve uh, uh, good electronical electrical conductivity. And within this domain, um, nanocrystals can be used for solution process, solar cells, thermoelectric materials, optical gain media, and field effect devices, infrared detectors. And um, again, I, I, by any means, I don't want to say that it's a small community, uh, especially now uh, when industry, uh, industrial players jo join the game, I, there is a growing consensus or probably already established consensus that these materials pro Semiconductor quantum dots do provide a versatile and competitive platform for optoelectronic devices. And the state of the art is that at the level of individual device, like single LED pixel or single transistor or single uh, um, detector pixel, we can do, we, we are very competitive. The field is very, these materials are very competitive to other uh, optoelectronic materials, especially solution processing. But that's not where we want to be ultimately. 
we want to move towards the systems level. So we, nobody cares about well, the market for a single uh, LED pixels, single LEDs are much smaller than the market for displays, for example. And same, you don't need, uh, except very niche applications, individual infrared detector pixel, you want to have a camera, <laughs> infrared camera. And uh, that brings me to the next level. And that was a missing part uh, a few years ago when we, when we looked into this. Um, so we need to find the ways how to not only make devices, individual devices out of uh, semiconductor quantum dots, but also how to make complex systems, how to pattern them. Like realistically, if we think, draw analogy with silicon technology, what made a more slow and modern of the electronic uh, modern semiconductor electronics possible is lithography development of and uh, evolution and <laughs> of lithography and uh, well that uh, the next part the last part of my uh, talk today will be about what we call dolphins and uh, it's the method that our group has developed a few years ago called uh, uh, uh, direct optical lithography of functional inorganic nanomaterials. So dolphin. The idea was that uh, if you have uh, um, solution materials like quantum dots, you and you want to pattern them, you want to make a complex circuitry out of them or array of uh, display pixels. Uh, you have different, you can use different methods. You can do inkjet printing, you can do transfer printing and uh, every method has advantages and disadvantages. And, and it's very important uh, to be again, realistic about um, what you can, what one technique can do and what other technique needs can do. And in many ways, there are many great things about, for example, inkjet printing, but uh, resolution wise, it's very difficult and probably, well, based on uh, current understanding of industry, maybe nearly impossible to scale below the resolution on the order of 10 microns or so. And uh, speed, it, it's a sequential. So you, you, you print like it's element by element. And if you need, let's say, a display to print a display, which has about 100 million sub pixels, it sounds like a challenge. And uh, on the other hand, in semiconductor, in modern semiconductor technology, we heavily rely on lithography. Lithography used photopolymers or photo that used as photoresists. And then if you make a photo layer photopolymer, you can expose it through uh, op well, locally through the mask uh, and uh, the, to UV light. And this exposure changes chemical properties and you selectively dissolve exposed or unexposed regions. And then you can deposit and pattern materials. And that works very well for vacuum deposition techniques. For solution deposition, it turned out like, like for quantum dots, it turned out to be not particularly uh, efficient for two reasons. First of all, capillary forces redistribute material when you, when you have uh, a layer of uh, photoresist with opened windows and then you spin code, let's say a layer of quantum dots or other solution processable materials. There will be huge capillary forces. They will and photopolymers often swell uh, in in the in solvents, and there are technical challenges. And we developed to uh, address these challenges. We developed a cause into traditional uh, photolithography that we call dolphin. And the idea is to do not use to avoid using photopolymers, photoresists, but instead use. Uh, design surface chemistry of nanoparticles uh, to be to act as a uh, photoresist. So the idea here is that we can uh, coat a, a layer of uh, quantum dots and then expose them and then exposed or unexposed regions, depending how we design the chemistry, uh, will allow us to remove selectively exposed or unexposed areas. And then when we repeat it multiple times, we can make in parallel, like what makes photolithography such a powerful technique is that it's a huge parallel uh, process. And you can define uh, billions of circuit elements in a single step. And uh, um, so that's something that now we can do with quantum dots. And that is, uh, 
that required a bit of chemistry. So we designed different surface chemistry, surface engineering uh, uh, of chemical engineering of particle surfaces utilizing different chemical strategies. One of the strategies can be also called photo acid generators that are used in traditional photopolymers, but now we specially design them to interact with nanocrystal surfaces. You can also use some more, some different types of uh, surface ligands. And in this case, uh, we design surface ligands that molecules that you attach to the nanocrystal surface. When you illuminate it with light, it just uh, get, uh, undergoes excitation, optical excitation, and that leads to photochemical decomposition, it just falls apart. And there are many other methods, in fact, that allow you to engineer uh, nanoparticle, well, to make nanoparticles photochemically patternable uh, using either deep UV uh, light or eye line radiation, or even very inexpensive of 400 nanometer radiation. And in this case, uh, well, again, it's very important. There is no solution that fits all. All needs. So you need it needs to be tailored to particular technology, to particular limitations, particular restrictions, and sometimes cost is a is a limitation. And then we can use inexpensive, very inexpensive materials and inexpensive patterning techniques. Sometimes resolution is a limitation, and then we sacrifice cost, but go after more sophisticated methods. Like, for example, we can use e-beam electron beam pattern into make a really, really high resolution uh, directly patterned in organic nanostructures. But I think what is exciting is that this type of chemistry works, or this type of approaches like dolphin uh, works for pretty much every material that can be synthesized by solution chemistry, like uh, metals, oxides, semiconductors. Most recently we published a work when we patterned, photochemically patterned uh, uh, perovskites. And, and many other materials. And practically it, um, you can do it for uh, designing of uh, optical photonic, uh, sorry, photonic elements photonic, uh, and optical gratings, for example. You can uh, pattern field effect transistors. You can pattern uh, optically transparent field effect transistors, for example, to drive individual pixels of LED screen. You can, um, pattern, something that probably most recent work and something that I believe may be really important is uh, there is a big challenge in uh, patterning uh, quantum dots for certain types of displays. And uh, in displays, uh, the type of technologies that you want to use to uh, during the manufacturing workflow depends on what display, what is the form factor of your display? Like if you talk about huge, huge uh, uh, displays, like large screens, the uh, subpixels typically on the order of 100 microns uh, in, in your TV that you have uh, at home. And that size, for that size, you probably should rely on inkjet printing because it has many advantages uh, in terms of material uh, usage and so on. Uh, but uh, if we go towards displays for small applications like uh, uh, smartphones, consume applications like IR, VR applications, micro displays, where display is tiny, the subpixel is smaller than 10, uh, significantly smaller than 10 microns, and you cannot, it cannot be printed. We need to look for different methods, and we just recently uh, reported a method that for, uh, that allows uh, patterning high resolution like micron and submicron patterning of uh, pixels of active operational uh, uh, quantum dot uh, light emitting diodes. And um, well, to summarize, it's kind of yeah, building and growing that what we can call like dolphin ecosystem. So we, uh, we develop different chemistries, apply them to different materials. We can push resolution. We, we are now moving into three-dimensional, 3D patterning. We are patterning active devices. And um, again, now, well, when we started working in this field around 2016, there was pretty much no work done. It was not recognized as an important technological challenge. But now there is a lot of 
work, a lot of competition, a lot of uh, active uh, development and very clever ideas coming from community, both in academia and in industry. And now let me uh, wrap up my presentation and just move to the summary to, to remind you what I've been talking about. And we, uh, we talked a little bit about chemistry, how to synthesize, how to do very high precision synthesis of different nanostructures, how to pack them in super lattices, how to engineer their surfaces using inorganic ligands for nanoparticles, for enzymes. And then we talked a little bit about photolithography, but uh, or direct optical lithography of nanomaterials and of dolphin. And uh, it's uh, now let me move to the most important <laughs> slide of this presentation. I want to emphasize that uh, the work that has that I've been talking about has been done by a great team of uh, students and postdocs uh, working at the University of Chicago. And I, I, I want to acknowledge the role of multiple collaborators we had privilege to work with over the years and thank the funding agencies that kept us afloat for all these years. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you very much for this very deep, comprehensive, and inspiring talk in the spirit of our seminars. That was a great pleasure Thank to you. listen to it. So, uh, can we now pass to uh, Q and A session, taking some questions? Absolutely. Do you want me to stop sharing screen, or should I keep? Yeah, it? yeah, maybe uh, as you like. Okay. So please ask questions. Send in a message through chat button or just by raising hand. Dimitri, perhaps uh, uh, I can ask the first questions. Participants are think preparing questions. I can ask directly. Have you tried? Have you tried uh, to construct using this uh, functional Greek uh, metamaterials? Metamaterials. Are you talking about optical metamaterials? Uh, well, well uh, metamaterials is a very broad uh, field. One area that we are currently exploring and uh, working on is to use dolphin uh, type methods for uh, building meta surfaces for meta, so called meta optics, where mm -hmm. um, uh, by designing, uh, by patterning uh, like the electric coating, you can control a specially controlled phase of uh, electromagnetic wave and uh, just build uh, lenses and build uh, other optical elements uh, that are uh, strictly two-dimensional, like 2D, uh, it's, it, this field is called 2D optics and, uh, or 2D photonics. And the idea here is that in fact, um, well, in principle it's possible. There is a, a theoretical, uh, legitimate theoretical foundation showing that you can engineer such materials. Like you can make a lens that are strictly two-dimensional. And the reason why uh, it's very important because actually, if we talk about cell phones or other consumer products, uh, some of the most expensive part of the uh, stages of technological workflow, manufacturing workflow is to uh, implement, well, you can do amazingly complex chips uh, like uh, electronic silicon uh, chips. But if you want, but then you need to combine them with uh, lenses, for example, for CCD cameras, for, for cameras that you use on cell phones. And that's extremely expensive. So if you can make a lens building, uh, if you can build lens as a part of the, manu of the uh, cheap manufacturing, like you, you make a redoubt circuitry, you put on top uh, material systems, well, layers that act as lenses or other photonic elements. It's, it's, it's a huge challenge and huge opportunity for uh, optoelectronics. So that we are, that we are working on, it's, there are, you, you need to be able to pattern uh, materials with very high resolution down to about 200 uh, nanometers. And it's, it's, it is pushing the limit of dolphin. So we are, we, we are learning how to do it. And it's, it's 
it's a work in progress. I see. Thank you. Very Thank welcome. you. Well, can you comment? Uh, I, I received a question. Uh, um, can you comment on the stability of these systems? Well, it's it's a very broad question, and uh, again, uh, depending on what materials um, you're talking about, it's uh, well. If you talk about quantum dots, um, they uh, and uh, depend what you compare in, in them to, like uh, one reasonable or legitimate competitor to nanomaterials are organic molecules like organic dyes and or laser dyes. Uh, and uh, quantum dots are more stable. They have been in, uh, in the early days, they have been introduced as a higher stability, more stable replacement of, of organic uh, chromophores, of organic dyes. If we talk about device stability, like for example, lifetime of OLED versus QLED, currently OLEDs are better. And the reason we believe is, at least uh, within industry and uh, academia, is that uh, just we are about 10 years behind, uh, well, we are, this field is a quantum dot field is about 10 years younger than OLEDs. And if you look into what OLED community was doing during the past 10 years was working on uh, improvement stabilities. So we, we are trying to learn, we are trying to catch, catch up and uh, reduce the gap. And um, intrinsically based on what we, how we understand the degradation uh, mechanisms, nanomaterials should be better. And uh, <laughs> yet to be shown if, because many, many technical aspects need to be solved. So there are examples of nanomaterials that are not stable or experience serious stability issues. And um, metal halide perovskites is one of those that uh, need to be, well, the community is currently exploring how to make them more stable. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a very broad question. Thank you. Also, Jan, please come. Yeah, actually, I just type on the chat area uh, this stability question. Um, this solution chemistry is really attractive, uh, but I see the one issue is the stability. That's why I just raised the, that question. Uh, okay, uh, the next question. But, uh, is... oh, oh, please, please go ahead. Thank, yeah. thank you for the answer, yes. Um, now, uh, the, there is a question, is classical thermodynamics sufficient to describe the dynamics of quantum transport in such nanomaterials or generalized uh, thermodynamics, non-Boltzmann statistics are needed? Um, well, transport in nanomaterials is, uh, if you're talking about electron transport, uh, has been analyzed and studied with, using different frameworks, um, theoretical frameworks. And uh, history, well, in the past, um, I, when we had materials with low electron mobilities, uh, we, uh, it, they could be very accurately and impressively well uh, analyzed and modeled uh, by hopping transport, or more specifically, Efrosh-Shklovsky variable range hopping uh, transport. And now uh, we are entering with improved material um, materials. We have mobilities that cannot be described uh, by um, uh, a hopping regime, and or at least we cannot. <laughs> and uh, it, and then we are entering into rather complicated and and uh, debated, heavily debated area of how to think transport about transport and at the cross over from uh, localized transport to delocalized transport. Um, and um, there are multiple uh, theories, transient localization theories. There, is, there, is, there are theories based on uh, Polaron, um, like a small Polaron, medium Polaron, large Polaron picture. And um, it's, uh, it's a very interesting and again, challenging frontier in, uh, in physics, in the physics of granular electronic systems. And they invoke a lot of Physics, like modern physics that people received Nobel prizes for, like Mott metal insulated transition, Anderson localization, all this is at play there. And we can in, in, even engineer systems to uh, move them from one regime into the other. 
it's yeah, it's a, it's an extremely interesting field, uh, and um, a lot of very interesting science is is done these days. And uh, well, is fractal another question? Is is fractal structures in nanomaterials, if there are any, uh, such as self similar structures, play important role in the dynamics? Uh, I don't, well, definitely fractal uh, dimensionality is a very common effect uh, to see in nanomaterials, and especially nanomaterial aggregates. And um, it's um, like the first example that comes to my mi mind is a very interesting work uh, on aerogel and uh, uh, nanoparticle aerogels and uh, um, where this fractal dimensionality was able to was utilized to make materials kind of open, very uh, low density, and for interesting catalytic properties. And some of the best work, to my knowledge, was done by Professor uh, Alex Eichmüller at uh, Technical University Dresden. And uh, yeah, so it's definitely possible. And something why I am so excited about nanomaterials that. They are so, it's such a versatile field that you can, if you work in this domain field for many years, you, you can <laughs> touch almost every aspect of modern physical sciences and probably biological sciences. And, uh, okay, let, let's see, uh, like another question, would it be possible to extend dolphin to 3D patterning techniques? I think yes, uh, I, especially using two photon lithography. Yes, it should be possible. Uh, we didn't do this, uh, but uh, we thought about it uh, for a number of years. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity. If you are interested, <laughs> please step by and do it. And another, I wonderful if there is a, the highest temperature that can be reached within molten salts. and. Is there any semiconductors that you want to synthesize below this temperature limit? Um, well, I, I think it should be not a problem to achieve high temperatures using molten salts because they will not uh, break apart, they will not chemically decompose. The problem is that uh, it's difficult to uh, maintain uh, particles in the, uh, without sintering and without uh, aggregation of growth uh, through austral ripening at very high temperatures. So we are currently kind of fighting with a compromise that, uh, well, for 3.5 materials, for 3.5 semiconductors that we are working with, uh, the optimal temperatures that we use are in the regime between 400 Celsius and maybe 550 Celsius. So occasionally we would like to go higher to higher temperatures to explore even those even more extreme conditions, more extreme situations. But uh, for three five semiconductors, um, the party the, it's not molten salt, but the semiconductors themselves start undergoing chemical unwanted chemical transformations. And uh, um, well, probably well, it's it's such an early field and such a different from all other activities. So we, we need to learn how to control this process and even what defines, uh, st determines stability in molten salts at high temperatures. And But molten salt it, itself, I don't think is a limitation for, from temperature point of view. Thank you. You're very welcome. So more question, please. So, it seems that there are no more questions. Uh, Dimitri, perhaps uh, uh, if you want, please uh, please give your final uh, comments and then we can close the session. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation and um, come to you. Well, if you are interested to have a great career, especially for young scientists, think about University of Chicago. It's a great place, one of the best places to to study uh, or, or work, and <laughs> we are we are looking for for for talented people. And I would like to express a welcome uh, welcoming note to to to consider University of Chicago as a place to to do science. Sure. And I I am very impressed about uh, science uh, that is done in in your country, 
again some of the best work in platelet in nano platelets um, for synthesis their synthesis and lasing and most very recently there was a very beautiful work on patterning of nano platelets for lasing application was done by Volkan Demmer at University of Bilkent and um, <laughs> I, I saw many other great works coming from, from Turkey these days. Thank you so much. That was a great pleasure for us. We will be also waiting, waiting for you in person to take participation in our summer schools on other activities or just as a visiting science. So uh, when this coronavirus situation will be resolved finally. So for the time being, please take care of you and uh, we hope to meet you in the nearest future here in, in our country. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. So bye. Bye. <laughs>